Today, my special guest on the Value Engineering Podcast is a good friend, a well-respected, experienced hydrogeologist by the name of Shane O'Neill. Shane, are you there? Good morning. Hey, I like your background. Very impressive. That's a, would you believe there's a story to that? Well, let's, that, us, let's hear that, the story in the background. The, um, that was a well development for a water supply well for a cider manufacturing company back in Ireland. One of the, it is the largest cider manufacturing company. And that's actually in their orchard where they grew all the apples for, for the cider manufacturing. I was developing a way, doing my, doing my business. And the next thing, didn't the marketing manager come out and she was overwhelmed by all this water squirting out of the ground and they ended up making an advertisement out of it with, with that going on in the background and all going on about the effervescence of the uh, cider and the purity. And yeah, I just, I just nodded my head and said, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's a lovely photo marketing. Um, so welcome to the show, Shane. Uh, now just a brief introduction. I know you have your masters and you focus in hydrogeologist, which is really the science of water in, in, in the ground, I believe. But uh, do you have your PhD now? I'm nearly there. I I'm, I'm, would be submitting in about a month, six weeks time. And then I have, will hopefully have defend it within about another six to eight weeks after that. So hopefully by midsummer, I'll be all done and dusted. And obviously the Irish background and uh, kudos to you for having your uh, away message on on St. Paddy's Day. We talked about that already. Yeah, yeah. In preamble. In any case, you came to BC. You're at UBC, Shane? I, I'm doing part-time PhD there, and I also teach part-time there. I, I run the uh, field school. We have an annual field school for two weeks. And so I teach undergraduates and graduates all about the black art of uh, hydrogeology field work. And um, so that's, that's a week of, of solid field work for them. And then they have to write up a report uh, based on all that field work. So that's uh, two, two weeks every year. And then I do teaching in the autumn, in the fall uh, of an undergraduate hydrogeology course. It's, a, it's an introduction to hydrogeology, but it's really the first and most cases, the only exposure a lot of those uh, engineers get to groundwater uh, unless they go on and do uh, a master's in geotechnical engineering then they get more exposure but really there's there's very little there, there's there's a fourth year course but it geotech engineers tend not to do that it's more for the people who want to go on to become hydrogeologists so um yeah i teach that as well that's a, a three-month course no i'm aware that in ireland you you probably practiced for 25 years, did you not? I mean, as a consultant? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was, it was 80, 88, I think I started and, and I moved over here in 2011. So yeah, good 30, 30 odd years of, of uh, hydrogeology in Ireland. Ireland is, is, is very like the Maritimes, um, which probably explains why so many Irish arrived over in Canada and tended to stay there because it was very like, like home. It's very varied geology and consequently hydrogeology. And when I came over here, it was March, it was actually March 16th, 2011. And I arrived over here and, and straight into the St. Patrick's Day celebrations the next day. But it never stopped raining till I would imagine mid-June. And I thought, there I am, traveled 7,000 kilometers, and the weather is exactly the same as in Ireland. So it was a bit disappointing. But then it picked up, and uh, you get beautiful summers here. Absolutely beautiful summers. And, yeah, BC is uh, God's country. You're fortunate to be out there in, yeah, in the great yeah. city of Vancouver. My mother actually came Irish descent from uh, probably around 1900, her family came in. Gosh. It would have been probably the potato famine. Wasn't there a famous potato famine? Uh, that was back in the, in the 1840s. I think it was 44 to 48 um, was, was 
the potato famine. Um, it might have been her parents, her grandparents. But there was, you know, Martin, there were, there were waves of um, waves of emigration. Uh, there was the famine was the big one, but then there were there were emigration in the late eight, 1800s and then again in the 1950s was a big time for Irish emigration abroad. Uh, and it's just driven by economics more than anything else. Yeah, well, there's certainly fine people. I, um, I've been to Ireland, golfing mainly. That would be my reason to be in Ireland. But the, uh, tell me a little bit about what a hydrogeologist is. And, uh, and I was interested to know that you, you really focus on rock slope stability in most of your practice, right? So hydrogeology is a very broad field. And I, I divide it up into, into two main areas. One I call what's resource hydrogeology. So that's water supplies, irrigation, and then there's contaminant hydrogeology, which is trying to remediate soils and remediate uh, contaminated groundwater. And thankfully in Ireland, we've, we've very little contaminated water. Uh, so I was into resource hydrogeology uh, most of the time. And then um, uh, a, a large mine opened up in Ireland in the mid nineties. Um, and I got an opportunity to work on that mine. And the thing about mining hydrogeology is technically very challenging. And you've also, you know, you've got to put your money where your mouth is and, and make a decision and go with that decision that you, you can't sit in the fence. Uh, there's just too much money involved. Um, timelines are too tight. I really enjoyed the mining hydrogeology because it's so technically so challenging. I had an opportunity based on that work to, to work in Arizona, New Mexico, even actually in the UK as well, in salt mines in, in, in Northern England. So I got a big exposure to, to mining hydrogeology. And then by 2010, I was spending all my time working in mining hydrogeology, mainly in, in Western North America, between you know, California, uh, worked on Borax Mine, which is the, um, in Death Valley. Temperatures get up to 120 degrees uh, Fahrenheit every day. I've worked uh, in, in Oregon, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, um, and then all up along the west coast of, of BC, Alaska, worked out in, in south, southwest Alaska, all the Aleutian Islands. There is potentially some very large um, copper mines that could be developed. But, you know, you've got to balance that against the environmental considerations. It's, it's a pristine environment in, in Alaska. So there's, there's a, a, a very difficult balancing act between you know, the need to develop resources and to need to be cognizant of, of, of the environment and, and all the people that depend on that environment. Because it's not simply, oh, it's nice to have a nice green forest or a nice clean water. In, in Alaska, people actually depend on it to live. Uh, so it's not even a nice to have, it's an, it's an absolute necessity. Again, that too is, can be a, a huge technical challenge to, to balance the needs of mining with the needs of, of the local people. It's a big challenge. And then as a subset of the mining hydrogeology, I got into pit slope stability. Uh, where you're looking at four, five, 600 meter high slopes. And um, it's all about trying to maximize the return on the investment. So they wanna keep the slopes as steep as possible. And that means really understanding the hydrogeology to manage the water within that slope. You may not be aware, or maybe you are aware that Godrich, where I'm in Godrich, has the largest salt mine in the world. And it goes down a thousand feet. They'd have three shafts. It goes down a thousand feet to uh, underneath Lake Huron, where they just mine the salt continuously year round. So, yeah, I no, I wasn't wasn't aware of it. I thought I thought it was Saskatchewan and Manitoba was was the big salt deposits here. But I remember going down a salt mine in in northern England, 
And we went down, it was a, it was 600 meters, 700 meter shaft. And then we got into a Land Rover and we drove for half an hour, 40 kilometers out underneath the North Sea uh, to look at uh, an inflow into this salt mine. And uh, 40 degrees Celsius in there, 100% humidity. So that was some experience, yeah, so. We certainly need a lot of salt in Southern Ontario, so probably a customer demand for the, the Goddard mm -hmm. salt mine. I think it used to be owned by Sifto. So I've had a couple of good experiences with you, Shane. You know, I can say that uh, some of your some of your associates, Troy and Matt James, were both looking forward to uh, utmost respect for, for how you carry yourself and, and for your ability to save money. And really what we're after here is, is uh, helping owners lower their CO2, and you've helped me on, on a couple of projects, but one in particular I'm gonna mention was in Nova Scotia where I called chain. And there was a, two high rises out in the middle of a harbor and there had been a very conservative assumption that when high tide came, they had to uh, have provision in the basement to deal with that by a basic raft slab and uh, very expensive construction and bringing you in, which frankly, the report I remember quite, well they paid was twenty five thousand, but he said that was the best value he's ever got <laughs> so kudos to you because yeah we did a slab on grade yeah gravel underneath it and it, it's still dry and so uh probably saved well i'm sure a million dollars but that was actually martin quite quite a straightforward job it it it, it was essentially looking at that the, the actual water levels that were there, uh, the tidal effects, and even looking, allowing for, for climate change and, and sea level rise. Uh, and then I just took it into a, a model, 2D model, uh, made some what if scenarios and, and came up with, with, with an answer. There, there's a, a, an approach in, in engineering, which is, is uh, a sort of a, a really, practical approach that you the what's called the observational method and um, I'm a big believer in, in that where you know rather than theorizing or hypothesizing that you actually go and dig the trial pit drill the hole you know do the test get the data and then make make the decision on that and and in that job in Halifax they they had really good data and so it, it gave me the confidence to be able to tell the guys what I, what I thought would happen under different scenarios and, and, and we went with it. So that was, um, yeah, that was a good job. Today, uh, in, in my own self-interest, I have a few patents and one of them is a bathtub uh, secant replacement patent where I, I, I can do a, a waterproof shot creek, which is another, you could call it a patent pending. And, and I have zero crack shot creek. So we put that by a soldier pile, we eliminate the secants, we can save a ton of money for owners and a ton of time. So in that situation, Shane, you'd be dealing in Toronto or Vancouver with situations that are over-regulated. And what they say is, well, we need a bathtub in the bottom. But in Toronto, you walk around the bottom of these P4, P5s and they're all dry. Yeah. Now they attribute it to the secant wall, but it's not to that at all. So what we're looking to do is drain that shoring and release the water, be responsible for the warranty on the waterproofing. So we're gonna replace waterproofing below grade with, with uh, shark cream. Wood float finish, two five inch layers. I think you've seen those details, but I wanted to pull you into that one because uh, it's a hydrogeologist of your, of your uh, capability that would be able to say to the owners, no, I'm quite confident. Here's a report. Here's your soil. Here's the tightness of the soil. We could talk a little bit about silts and sands now and, and clays, because obviously you know what I'm talking about, right? Sure. There's a difference, and people don't, don't appreciate this, between dewatering, which is essentially drying up the soils, and depressurizing, which is increasing the effect of stress. And a lot of the soils that you see in Toronto are low permeability soils. So they're not going to give a lot of water. 
Um, so you're not trying to dewater them. What you're trying to do is depressurize them. For very little water yield, uh, you can increase the effect of stress, increase the strength of the soils, and so minimize the need for any sort of piling. And that's why the, the, the shock creed approach works so well, uh, because you're, you're, you're not trying to replace uh, a, a reinforced concrete wall. You're, you're literally trying to keep the excavation open and depressurized to allow it the construction to go ahead uh, as normal. And, that, and that's why it works so well with your, your products. Yeah, I think they're quite novel. I suppose if you even took the example of a self-drilling bar, because I'm recommending an R51 bar, which lowers the anchor load when you get rid of the hydraulic pressure on a case on wall. As Matt Jane says, there's a construction joint every two feet. Now we have no construction joints in comparison, but if I have a self-drilling bar and I do a 50 or 60 foot long anchor and I drain that soil, that effective stress will actually increase the, the capacity yep. of that anchor. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and the soil itself increases in strength. Correct. So you get, you get a, a double a double bite. Probably even the footings at the base of the P4 garage are more substantially, uh, you know, I talked to Troy Izagonis a week ago about that. And uh, the nature of the large engineering consolidations we've seen, and, and you put it very kindly when we talked the other day that, you know, the large engineers are busy. So their hydrogeologist department doesn't have the time, right? No. And, and yet mid-size firms, they lack the experts. So you have a pretty interesting niche if you wanted to do marketing. I think I could fill your boots with <laughs> Yeah, as I was saying, that the, the large companies will have a few hydrogeologists on the staff, but they're just so busy. They, they can't devote the time that a lot of these jobs need. And they, they're pulled left, right, and center. And then the smaller companies can't afford to carry a hydrogeologist because there isn't enough work for them. So I find that I can provide uh, a boutique service, uh, and particularly in, in conjunction with somebody like yourself, where we can provide not only the hydrogeology, but also the engineering component as well as a, as a one-stop shop. And um, that works really well. Yes, well, I know that uh, Troy would love to have you join his firm, Turan Group. And I said, well, I'd see what I could do, but I don't have, I think he's pretty well looked after and he wants to live your life too, because you have four kids, right? I do. I do. My, my eldest was 29 yesterday. Um, so that, that came as a bit of a shock. Uh, I can still remember the, 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 the day she was born as if it was yesterday, but, uh, you know, 29 years and, and then the youngest is 23. I'll be shocked for saying this, but yeah, 23. They, you know, I've been really lucky. They, they're great kids. Uh, about two of them went on to become engineers. I was a civil engineer and a structural engineer. Uh, the eldest is works in HR for a multinational. And then the, the second uh, boy, he's, uh, he's in uh, what's called property surveying. Does an awful lot of commercial realty uh, for you know, for, for investment companies looking to buy property as investments. So they've, they've all gone on with their lives. My priority was always to make sure I could educate them to the best of my ability. And I feel that's probably the best gift I can give them uh, is, is an education. And uh, they certainly grasped that opportunity and, and, and made the most of it. So uh, that's uh, really satisfying to have, you know, four kids like that done well for themselves. Something that you mentioned a little bit earlier, and I, I'd like to touch on it a bit. There's a lot of the audience that I would get would be on the special foundation side, but this idea of dewatering, whether it's well points or inductors, do they still, they still do inductors? They still do well points, right? Those technologies. They still are, do well points. Yeah, it, it's, it's very site specific, but yeah, they do. And, yeah. and what a lot of owners wouldn't necessarily appreciate, or, or maybe the excavators think that you can just turn that system on, but it needs time, right? 
Yeah, if I had a penny for every time I, I told a, a, a con contractor or a miner that they need to get in ahead of the excavation, I'd be a multimillionaire. Unfortunately, dewatering or depressurization is not a just-in-time exercise. Most excavations would require two or three months of dewatering ahead of the development. Now I'm talking about large scale, small scale, no, but you know, large scale where you're looking at mine pits that could be a kilometer long, but maybe 500 meters wide, you, you, you'd be looking at months of dewatering ahead of actually breaking ground and getting, getting into, the, into the excavation. And similarly here in Vancouver, the soils are low permeability, silts, um, clays, uh, and even some of the fill material is very low material, it's low permeability. So it's really important that you get in ahead of the excavation. And with experience, I know you need to get in between eight to 10 weeks ahead of when you first hope to go below ground level or below the water table. And unfortunately, that device tends not to be heated. So, um, which keeps me busy, but uh, I, you know, there, it could be avoided. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about an owner who has to recognize the need for dewatering. So yeah. They probably ignore your first suggestion that they may need it. And then when they hired the shoring guy and, or, or the excavator and, and somebody's gonna say, well, we'll dig a hole in the middle and then they need it, then there's no time, right? Exactly. And, you know, it's not even just managing the water uh, and, and in increasing the strength of the soils. Uh, you know, I was involved recently in a, in, a, in, a, in a large excavation in downtown Vancouver. And they, because the, everything is sequenced and, and you've got to put in the sequin piles and you've got to put in the tiebacks and it's all done in a very choreograph choreographic way. Um, they, the contractor found with the excavation that the burns required to uh, facilitate the installation of the anchors wasn't strong enough to, to hold up the equipment and they had to wait you know, several weeks for, for, the, for the burns to drain. And in the meantime, they were trying to excavate out the material and the trafficability of the soil was very poor. And it just was one delay compounded on another delay and it could have all been avoided had they depressurized ahead of the excavation. That was their call. My uh, my point is that sea cans are not only wasteful, but they're they're the they're the only thing people reach for. They don't stand back and do a bit of value engineering at the start, which is key to mm. these projects. Mm. To to meet the owner when he's trying to arrange his financing or sell his condos and say, you know, uh, you might you might well run a value engineering phase, which is only about a week in a formal, say the international sense. But, you know, we in, in Footprint and, and, and people like yourself can pull this together in a phone call. And, you know, somebody with 40 years experience like yourself, it would be uh, wise that people get to know you and, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, be, you'll be better known by being on my podcast. But when you dam up the water on sea cans, you're automatically giving away the opportunity to do a shotcrete solution, which naturally will drain the soil by the time you get down to the footing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I can show you some really good data that as the excavation was going ahead, the pore pressures were dropping always just ahead of the development, which shows that the concept of depressurization with your shotcrete uh, will work. I mean, I've got the data to show it, to prove it. It's a more elegant solution, uh, and it's certainly cost-effective. It reduces the time required to do the excavation because you're not waiting around for, for soils to depressurize. It's a win-win for the owner and for the contractor. You know, one of the owners that I'd like to mention would be the government, and uh, particularly these large transportation projects. Because when they automatically reach for secants, then they're, they've got a whole wide body of, and they're assuming they need thick, thick walls for whatever history caused those and, and a thick, thick raft slab. And frankly, those jobs, I'm quite sure a billion dollar transit project could be done for half that money. 
And I don't see why we can't aim for that. Now, to go back to the large engineering house, a lot of those guys get 8% of hard cost. And I like to turn the knife a little bit on them here yeah. because they, they don't reach for the solution other than what they did last time. Well, why should yeah. we change it? The details yeah. are already there, but it's their job to redesign it and explain to the owner, we deserve as much fee because we just saved you money. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Like I, I agree, agree with you, Martin. It is a, is a little bit of a bugbear with me that, that some professions get paid as a percentage, uh, and, and I would include architects in that. Uh, whereas the likes of me, anyway, it, it's a, it's usually a fixed fee, and, and that's it. Um, but you know, engineers, if you go working with a geotechnical engineer, he or she is is quite happy with a factor of safety of 1.1, 1.2. I mean, some of those six, seven hundred meter high slopes, they actually design them to fail. So the civil engineer doesn't have that luxury. And they've got a design to usually 1.4, 1.5 of a factor of safety, which tends to be an over-design. And, and I think, as you say, if they were, could step back uh, initially and see you know, where is the risk, where is the reward, and modify what had been a previous project for this new project to better suit the actual conditions rather than try and shoehorn in a previous solution that might not really be appropriate for their next project. So um, again, maybe that's where- to, Maybe there has to be regulation chain. I mean, you know, the, you know, if our government wanted to save money, then, then they should mandate. And I think the DOTs in the States are a little better at this, that they would, they would have a larger value engineering industry. And we're just locked in with these large, consultants, I think, but nonetheless, there's a lot of small mid-sized guys that deserve a shot. And, uh, mm. you know, my, my goal is to, to reduce the size of sub in Toronto subway walls are one meter thick. So, you know, now they're shot creating them, which is great, but that is crazy. When you look at how can it possibly be that low? They got a case on wall behind it <laughs> and or secant wall. So that secant wall in my system, and I know you'll connect the dots quickly on this. We weld tabs to that pile. We don't debond that pile with the, with with uh, waterproofing. So you actually have a, a composite wall, and you could do the. I could do those subways. I think with uh, a sixteen-inch wall. Yeah. And, and tie the piles to it, uh, but and and then do the bypass shotcrete. Anyway, we call it bypass shotcrete. I invented it at my previous company. But the, uh, the advancement was to think through the actual drainage board detail, which, you know, in Vancouver, you'll put drainage board behind panels if you have to. Yeah. To still get a soil nailing job done. And, and I did that at the Bow project in Calgary years ago, but uh, it didn't really need it. But then I looked at the bottom of an 80 foot cut with a perch Berlin wall, secant wall over two city blocks through the Calgary gravels, and there was no water at the bottom. You know, the... The excavator, a good friend of mine, Jan from Professional, was paid, I'm going to say, $57,000 by the construction oh. manager for 18 months to dewater. And he, he dragged a two-inch pump around for a while. And then, and then they just said, ah, we'll give it to you, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, you know, it's all about system choice, right? Yep. I know another area, I mean, we can move on from that. Uh, we got our digs in there, I guess. But the... Uh, Another area is geothermal. Yeah. Now you've had the chance to look at my geothermal patent, the FEBTU cell. We'll get one up on the screen at some point, but the, uh, can you uh, talk about your experience in geothermal, particularly high water tables versus dry conditions mm. and comment on where that industry is going? Because I really believe we have to use the heat of the earth. Yeah, yeah. In a more positive way in the cooling. That we can get from this. Yeah, you're, the the footprint engineering BTU cell is is essentially a standing column, uh, and it tends to be an, a very efficient, uh, environmentally friendly approach. The essentially the standing column uh, is filled with, with water, 
and that slowly circulates. It's in contact with all the soil around it, and it slowly changes over over the weeks and months. And then you have your your uh, closed loop system, which is your refrigerant running down into the water column, extracting out the heat. Or if in the summer you can actually extract out the uh, the heat of uh, you can cool buildings in the summer and heat them in the winter. Uh, and it's it's an extremely efficient, cost effective system. But you do need the water table reasonably close to the surface. Uh, and it tends to be within five to 10 meters of the surface in, in most, most places in Canada. Uh, the exceptions would be some of the very high topographic areas. So there's really no reason why it couldn't be applied in most areas. Beauty about, about your system is that it could be easily modified for, for piles so that you could have a, have a geothermal pile system. And also where, where they're of most use is for, for large thermally low inertial buildings, which take a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. They're really most efficient. Uh, for, for those applications. And then you've got the added bonus of cities being essentially heat islands. Um, because they have the parkades, uh, you get a lot of heat from buildings dissipating underground. And that in turn is taken up by the water and the water can then be used to heat your closed loop system. And so heat the, heat the building. So you're in fact over 12 months recycling some of the heat that was originally lost from the building back into the building again. Um, so again, in terms of CO2, it's uh, a positive CO2. And you're also um, with, with your coefficients of performance of around four, five. So again, less fossil fuels needed and it, it's amenable to, to uh, solar panel and photovoltaic sources of energy. So there's there's really no downside to, to that system. Yeah, I actually call it a magic water table because of the way I overflow the two rings. And uh, yeah, I exactly. see, you know, I'm gonna bet that I get up upwards on, keep in mind, I'm not doing a long loop. I'm, I'm basically going in uh, with a, a short loop. And- Oh, it's about 50 feet, water. isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a potential. We're gonna we're doing testing now on a couple of farms, and, yeah. and you know the nice thing about this too. There's a lot of foundation drill rigs. There's not that many geothermal borehole rigs, and they're usually busy. Yeah, yeah. So if we can get the foundation drill guides busier, these these products are commercially available. The steel is usually mill reject or second uh, gas pipe, spiral welded, larger diameters. So You've done a lot of geothermal. Like, do you get called out now as in geothermal? Uh, I haven't here in Canada, but in Ireland, I, I used to do an awful lot of um, what's called low enthalpy geothermal. So, groundwater up to about 20, 25 degrees C. And we would do it for heating large uh, buildings. Um, glass houses was another really big one, um, swimming pools. Uh, fish farms, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of interest um, in it as a source of, of heating water uh, cheaply and environmentally friendly. So uh, yeah, it, it kept me busy for for a long time, but I, I just haven't had the opportunity here to to get involved in geothermal. Well, uh, it must have been a, a change when you came over. Because Europe has been fairly progressive on the energy side for a while, and yet in North America, I think we it's fair to say we've been fairly wasteful, depending a lot on natural on gas. And yeah, uh, yeah, the, the times are changing, here. as you know. I think the changes are positive. Oh sure, but you know, yet BC, for example, gets the majority of its energy from hy uh, uh, hydro, so it, it's actually really good. Good, in a good position to uh, not alone cut down on fossil fuels, but use all that hydro energy to recharge the batteries for all these uh, electric cars. And so 
that's probably why BC is so far ahead of the curve uh, in terms of renewables. I think it's by accident more than by design. You know, I heard a comment made about electric cars the other day, which was quite, quite uh, true, that the battery being what it is, uh, and the U.S. being what they are relative to, uh, you know, coal and whatnot, that you actually end up with a relationship where a third of that power is uh, coal generated because of the nature of what, yeah. what is that? Have you heard that one? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, but it's, I mean, the relationship to the battery, though. You know what's what's involved in making the exactly battery. and and even though the concept is 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 the correct concept i mean you've got the issue of what you do with all these old batteries uh, it's not easy to recycle them so there there's you know the principle is right it's i think we're going to find that it'll take five ten fifteen years for us to get the entire life cycle of an electric car correct so that uh, all of it can be recycled and renewed uh, on an ongoing basis. But, um, but I remember that the, when the Prius came out first and we were all delighted with this hybrid car and, and it was best thing since sliced bread. But it dis they discovered how when they did the, the, the math on the um, on the energy used to build the car in the first place, that it took three years of being used uh, on the road before the savings in terms of fossil fuel uh, were paid off against the original cost of building that car. So we've got to be careful as a society that we don't um, put on blinkers and say, this shall be so. Uh, and not be aware of, of the potential uh, impacts, uh, un, 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 unknown impacts uh, that, that might arise. So do you have any solar yourself? Are you uh, in a condo or are you in a, in a house now? I'm in a, in a townhouse, but I, when, I, when I lived in, in Ireland, I had solar panels on, on the roof. And I had a geothermal well heating the house, underfloor heating. And um, I would have had photovoltaic, but uh, the, the energy, the electricity provider in Ireland wasn't very amenable to photovoltaic and it would have been cost prohibitive for me to put them on the roof. But I did have, yeah, I had the solar panels and I had the geothermal energy for the house. So yeah, I was as, I was as good as I could be. You know, we had a big fit program that was criticized, feed-in tariff program in Ontario, but it left a legacy of uh, believers in uh, solar. And certainly I did a number of solar farms, uh, cost-effectively, uh, where these 10 kilowatt or 100 kilowatt farms would be built with small diameter drilling and uh, usually using the undesirable farmland. And there mm. can be a lot of that in BC. I suppose you're either on the end of a mountain or your or your farmland's quite fertile. But in Ontario, we we've got land as we go north where a lot of people did these solar farms and or put windmills. And uh, I find the energy space very interesting. You know, as a civil engineer, I like to cross over and, and welcome uh, any associate who who would be in mechanical or electrical or in particular energy based. And uh, in, in subsequent podcasts, we're going to do one a week of these these podcasts right. to try and get to the heart of the CO two matter. Personally, uh, do you believe in zero point energy? Yeah, that's a contentious topic, but or a hydrogen fuel cell. I mean, these are things that I think yeah. are impressed. The proposal uh, in Canada is ultimately to use renewables to generate hydrogen cells to give power, whatever. Um, so for, for me, that's, that's a, a, a sort of a net zero energy approach. So yeah, I, I think it's possible um, between using renewables and, um, and, and hydrogen cells that, would, that could get us over the line. But um, that I don't sure if the technology is quite there yet, uh, but uh, it's certainly something that could be achieved in the next five to ten years. If you had your 
if you were in charge of uh, other than uh, if you were the president of the U.S., what would you do? You know, would you, they're doing their best. I don't know if uh, if Trump's a believer, if he gets back in, if he's a believer in uh, renewables. But I think the writing's on the wall for some of these technologies. And they're running out of oil. Look at the price of gas. Yeah, yeah. You and I will, will sit in a pub somewhere in 100 years' time and look back at 2022 or 2025, and we will know that there was a seminal change and, and the change has been without being meaning to be anyway political that you know you you've got to diversify in terms of energy sources because Europe is so dependent on energy from from Russia they're now realizing that that's just politically not a safe way to go and consequently they're not alone looking at reducing fossil fuels, but conversely, they need to look at renewables. And I think we look back at this, you know, five to 10 years as being the pendulum when the pendulum started swinging the other way and renewables uh, became de facto the normal and fossil fuels reduced and reduced until I say their long-term use will probably be in pharmaceuticals it won't be used as an energy source to drive industry. That's How do you same. feel coming from Ireland, but maybe also being on the, uh, the green side in, in BC? Uh, how do you view climate change yourself, just personally? I'm alarmed by it. Uh, being from BC, we had, we had uh, the heat dome here last year. Uh, and I remember getting up one morning at you know, five or six in the morning, and feeling the wall on the way down to the kitchen. And the wall was, was warm, like really warm. And I, I was said, to myself, Look, this, this cannot go on. We cannot be, be deliberately doing this to ourselves such that these either heat domes or catastrophic storms such as the hurricanes in, in, the, in the Atlantic uh, are going to keep occurring on a, on a more and more frequent basis. Because if you think about it logically, all this extra heat is essentially energizing the weather systems. It's becoming more and more extreme. When you just even look back at the, at the we, had, um, we had one in 500 year storms here in November, uh, where the, the, the whole of the, the um, uh, mainland valley here in, in Vancouver was flooded for four or five days. And uh, the, the entire lower mainland was cut off from the rest of, of Canada because of those floods. Uh, and, and it's just not sustainable. Insurances won't sustain it. Governments won't sustain it. Uh, and again, talking about the pendulum, uh, the penny will finally drop that we've got to do something about this, that you know, long-term plans over 25, 30, 40 years, just not gonna do it. We need to do something now. And that's the way I feel it. That's the way I feel about it. Well, it makes makes someone like you all the more important to uh, for people to wake up and realize that anything you can do to reduce concrete and steel use is going to be large in the equation of CO2, which is 40% yeah. of the built environment, generally recognizes 40% of the built environment. Um, you know that the CO2 problem, a lot of people don't realize this, but the, for the benefit of the listeners also, uh, we've done this in 30 generations. And uh, the last 25 years is half of it. Did you know that? No. It's Gosh. Half, it's half of the CO2 that's been measured in the atmosphere. So, you know, there's been tremendous growth, but at, at, at an expense. And uh, I welcome the initiatives everywhere. I mean, I basically dedicated my career to this. So the, 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 uh, not that my career was worth that much, but the, <laughs> the fact is that, you know, I've done a lot of jobs and I can make a difference. And so can you, Shane, you know? Yeah. And uh, well, yeah. I, I asked, I really think I'm grateful to you. We're, we'll, we'll wrap this up shortly, but I'm grateful to you for coming on, but also uh, for everything you do to reduce waste for owners. Because it, it equates to CO two. Well, it ultimately does. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the the driver for most of my clients is is to be 
cost effective, not necessarily cheap. Um, they're quite happy to spend the money if the results give them a, a overall a more effective project. Uh, but the upside of that is usually that uh, because it's better planned and that the you know, best available technology is used, that the, the, the need for, as you say, concrete or rebar, that's all reduced. And so there are the knock on savings on, on CO2. That's always uh, gratifying to know that when you get involved in a project that you're able to positively contribute to the overall savings in terms of, of money, but nearly by default, savings on, on, on CO2 then as well. Other than talking about St. Patty's Day one more time, but uh, I, you know, I quit drinking. So that, that was right. to take it easy on all the people that, that I used to you know, drink with. But um, <laughs> I, it's cheaper, but yeah. uh, we got money anyway. We all have enough money. You'd have to say you have enough money. You paid for your kids' education. You did well, Shane. So the question is, you know, should we put some money towards some of these other problems in society? And I encourage anybody with any, uh, you know, interest in in the human race to uh, pay attention to what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And get involved. Get involved. I I personally have a mission to get rid of rebar in the crack environment like that idea of crack control rebar if we can pour concrete that doesn't crack then these are these technologies are actually available it's just a series of ad mixes that combine synergistically yeah and we'll have uh, subsequent shows where we'll talk about those in more detail anyway shane i just want to thank you again and for all the readers out there uh shane's available so your uh, consulting business is how do you actually look it up on the on your, uh, on your, um, the name, the name of the business, uh, O H G E will, will find me or O'Neill hydro geotechnical engineering. I have a, I have a web page, and, uh, got the usual LinkedIn as well. So, um, either way you'll, you can, you can find me or even just type in Shane O'Neill that, that usually pulls up my, um, my business web page too. Well, Shane, you know, I don't, I don't just love you because you're Irish, right? But I love you because you're a great engineer. And uh, keep up the good work. And, and thanks very much for being a guest today. And thank you, Martin. It's been a pleasure.